uh, this meeting start really what's up
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call the meeting to order. At this juncture, I recognize the presence among us of His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of the City County of Nairobi, His Excellency Jiroge Mushiri, with us. Also, um, the UNDP uh, country representative. I want us to start for, to stand up for the national anthem. Thank you. We may take our seats. When they ran for office, persuaded the citizens and uh, voters of Nairobi to listen to them and vote for them. They made a critical appeal that they want a city of order, hope, and opportunity for all. And for such kind of a city to materialize or to work, the essence, the need for partnerships is very crucial. And that is why Nairobi City County Government has found it very critical to engage with a major partner such as UNDP for purposes of realizing that dream, that aspiration for a city of hope, order, and opportunity for everyone. I think to put into perspective just the essence of this partnership and why UNDP has found it vital to engage with the city county of Nairobi, ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to invite here this moment for an overview by the UNDP country representative, Mr. Anthony Gororano, to make his appropriate remarks. Welcome, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's still early, let me try again. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a real pleasure and honor to have you all here, literally at the crack of dawn. Uh, and I think this is testament to our shared belief and conviction, not only about partnership, but about really the, the promise, the, the potential that together we want to exploit uh, and leverage. And I think what brings us here today beyond the partnership, and, and I think my colleagues will speak to this, is really this question of how can we harness the data revolution for development of Nairobi, of Kenya, of the region. So it really gives me great uh, pride, and I'm very humbled to see such uh, a constellation uh, of stakeholders. Um, I think I can safely say that uh, the different bases are covered. I know we have amongst us leaders, eminent leaders from the private sector. Without wanting to embarrass anyone this early in the morning, I'd like our private sector friends and colleagues, please, to stand up and be recognized. Private sector colleagues, I'm looking at some of you straight up, if you'll please stand. Good morning and a warm, warm welcome. I think you have here the representatives of some of the titans of industry in the technology sector in Kenya. Thank you very much. You can say. We also have uh, amongst us some a number of very distinguished, eminent uh, 
uh, and, and, and really genial colleagues coming from the world of international development. I'm looking at one of them uh, amongst others, uh, Dr. Tim Kelly, uh, and I'd like to invite my colleagues from the international development space to stand up and also be recognized. So international development, that includes UNDP, by the way, so UNDP colleagues. <laughs> Thank you very much. Last and definitely not least, the glue that brings us here together, the, 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 the cement, the center of gravity that makes development everywhere possible. That is, if you will, our um, hosts, um, the, apart from, of course, His Excellency, the Deputy Government, the Deputy, the Deputy Governor, uh, our hosts, um, that is Nairobi County Government. Uh, really, they are at the center of this. We are here for them. We walk this journey with them. I'd like to invite uh, their representatives uh, to stand up. So Nairobi Government colleagues and other folks from the public sector, please stand up and be recognized. Fantastic. I think a round of applause because these are these are these are those that lead us. Thank you very much. So we've got quite a packed program. Uh, I know that the discussions leading up to today have been extensive. Uh, I hope have been inclusive, and most importantly, uh, I, I really pray translate into action. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know in terms of the promise of data for development. So maybe first spoiler alert. What I do want very briefly uh, to talk of, or at least to reiterate, uh, are some of the things that bring us here together, and maybe more importantly, some of the some of the objectives and ambitions that we're hoping to help galvanize and catalyze. First and foremost, maybe a story of paradoxes, paradoxes that I think, at least in the case of UNDP bring us to in, invest a, a great deal of energy and, 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 and thought and reflection and resources uh, in trying to unlock this puzzle as to why is it uh, that we, on one hand, uh, sit, I think, atop uh, a very crowded field in terms of the importance, or should I say the prominence uh, of data and technology. And so the Silicon Savannah, the, the, the hope of Africa in terms of data, call it what you will. Kenya really does sit at the frontier. And what makes this all the more exciting is that Kenya doesn't just sit, as you will know, at the frontier in terms of the sub-region. So I'm from the region, a country, a country of many hills somewhere in the south that looks on with envy to Kenya. But beyond the region and beyond the, the continent, Kenya does occupy a, a, a position that I think is worthy of, of reflection as well as admiration as a leader in many ways. I'm not going to talk about things you know, I'm not going to talk about mobile payments, uh, I'm not going to talk about really the, the, the genius, the talent that has come and continues to come to Kenya uh, or from Kenya in this space. But only to say that there are, there are maybe three things, if you will, that as a development organization, uh, we, we, we aim to focus attention on. The first paradox is, is what I'd call the paradox of uptake. So you have some of the world's leaders uh, in the technology space uh, located here, co-located here, but more importantly, you have a local, a thriving local ecosystem of coders, of programmers, right, of, of, of folks, you know, touching on all facets of technology. But while this is so, when we look at the, the hard, cold reality of decision-making, uh, we, we find somewhat of a discrepancy. So on one hand, we have the capacities, the skills, the assets, but on the other, we don't see this uh, reflected. Uh, we don't see it reflected uh, in the, the quality uh, of decisions. And there are a number of reasons, and I think a number of you will speak to these, but this is, if you will, paradox number one. Paradox number two uh, speaks to, to a related but nonetheless distinct field, which is that of decision making. If I may name names um, and, and speak of, uh, uh, let's say, a telco, a telco that some of you might have heard of, uh, that has, I believe, around 85 to 90 percent of market share, Safaricom. Safaricom are very proud to, 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 and for good reason, to tell us that in terms of lending, and I, for those of you who don't know, 54% of lending today in Kenya is done online, right? So it's a big number. So in terms of decision-making, you know, we're told that it's almost entirely done. Actually, I think I'll say to, to quote our, our good friend Peter, who I know couldn't make it today, but it's entirely done on the basis of data, right? And, and, and that's pretty astonishing. It's astonishing, especially when you look at countries that in terms of income and wealth, uh, are far ahead of Kenya, but tells you uh, of just, if you will, the, the tip of the iceberg. 
Now, why am I referring to this as a paradox? Well, simply because, as you might guess by now, when we look at decision making uh, in the public sector, again, this is not so. And so I think in terms of um, decision making, there are many different pieces, of course, of the decision making equation. Uh, and yes, mobile phone data is, is a very difficult thing to, to translate into better decisions. But nonetheless, I think the discrepancy is quite striking. Lastly, um, I'd say the paradox of fragmentation. And, and what do I mean? So as I said, you've got very many operators, right? Public, uh, many, uh, even in the public, many private, many also in the public sector, in the folks in the international space, all working and pulling in the same direction. But when you actually, you know, take a, uh, you stand back and you take a look and you ask some of the questions that we've been asking, not just to the county of Nairobi, but our friends uh, in central government, you know, it becomes pretty clear, pretty quickly, that as things stand, the sum is far from being greater than the parts, right? So there's something to be said about partnership. And I think, if you will, that's where I, I, I want to, that's the note I, so to speak, want to leave uh, us on the importance of partnership. In other countries in which UNDP and many of you have the opportunity to walk uh, and accompany societies to harness data, we, we see what partnership can achieve. But partnership, of course, is something that we all know, especially in this state, is, 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 uh, is something that's intentional. It's something that's deliberate. It's the fruit of a great deal of effort. And I think what personally I would like to see come from today is, if you will, the beginning of a journey, but not any ordinary journey, a journey that I hope we will undertake together, because it is together that actually we have the vast totality of answers from questions of technology, capacity, the, the, the gravitas and pull of the state, or in this case, uh, the county, we have all the ingredients. I think it becomes a question of threading this together. With those few words, I want to welcome you. I want to thank you for your commitment. I want to thank you for being here before 8 a.m., which for many, including myself, is a struggle, but I think one that will be worthwhile. Thank you very much, Asante Sana. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, those insightful remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, in this 21st century, data is to development and progress what oxygen is to mankind. And we appreciate that we can't do without it uh, from the scientific aspects of it. Mankind today is doing so much to harness the wind. If we do much as well to harness the benefits of science to inform decision-making and development, I'm sure we are capable of making greater critical strides than what we've done in the past uh, couple of uh, decades past. In, as we get to closer to the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, we appreciate that the place of, as uh, my good sir has indicated, seeing how we can make the interlinks of these three paradoxes and partnerships I am sure that so much can be done and achieved. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to invite Mr. Uh, to, to invite uh, the country director of JZ, Bodo Iming. He's not there. Okay, thank you. Now, the Nairobi City County government has got a critical development framework that is the inter inter integrated development. Uh, plan that is the roadmap for development, for progress. It is that microscopic eye through which His Excellency the Governor and the Deputy Governor are ensuring that they bring critical teams together to make the people of Nairobi realize the promise that they made. To have us appreciate the weight of these partnerships, these interlinks, and why it is very important for us to have this discussion this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, no other than His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of the City County of Nairobi, His Excellency Njoroge Mushiri to make his remarks. Good morning, everybody. Um, like uh, our good friend uh, Mr. Gorona is saying, 
it's quite early for us to start making speeches in the morning or usually we'll be preparing for the day and stuff like that uh and especially those of us who are in politics who spend a lot of time consulting late into the evening so i'm happy to see all of you here very early in the morning and i think it's a manifestation of your interest in the partnerships that we are looking to forge between uh, ourselves as the Nairobi City County Government and uh, the various partners and, and the stakeholders that we have in here today. And of course, we appreciate very much the role of the, the UNDP in putting it, all this together. So uh, allow me to, at the outset, uh, bring my the greetings of His Excellency, uh, the Governor of Nairobi City County, Governor Sakaja Ada Johnson, who is out of the country, uh, but most likely somewhere online watching us uh, because he's so keen on what we are doing today. Uh, and also uh, to assure you of his uh, highest level of support in the activities and the initiatives that we are going through. So I'll, I'll just go through his speech and, and deliver his message as, uh, as uh, agreed. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Gorano, the resident rep of the UNDP, partners, colleagues, uh, good morning. My, I am delighted not just to join so many distinguished Kenyans, so many innovators and so many friends of Kenya and in particular Nairobi, but also to be your host here in Nairobi and Karibuni Sana. Let me start this with gratitude for UNDP Kenya. It's a sign of your generosity and trust that you've joined us in this journey of transformation. Nairobi must change this county must become better at serving its people and making itself accountable to them. And, and uh, we say that because we know we have a very high level of standard to which we are judged because we are very visible. Uh, we have many international organizations that operate in Nairobi. Uh, our national government operates from Nairobi. And therefore, the performance of the Nairobi city county government is always at every point under scrutiny, and therefore we have to ensure that our service delivery is, is top notch. You appreciate, you appreciate this as well as we do, which is why you entered a partnership in March this year, a partnership, let me add, that's already beginning to bear fruit in this county government's administration. So it's a real pleasure to stand before you today and to reflect with you on a topic that matters deeply to us and to you. It is a topic of the utmost importance the use of alternative data resources for inclusive, inclusivity, safety, resilience, and sustainability in the administration of Nairobi City County. It matters especially because we promised to restore order, dignity, hope, and opportunity to Nairobi and Nairobians. We can't do that unless we have a perfectly clear idea of how the people of Nairobi live now, what difference our interventions make to their lives and how we are going to implement that. We need to know to make policy. We need to know to make policy. And we need to know the effects of that policy to stay on track for the people of Nairobi. Ladies and gentlemen, data matters. The integration of alternative data sources offers a transformative opportunity to meet the goals. If we can collect and verify this data from these sources, we can capture insights that might otherwise remain hidden, enabling us to craft policies and initiatives that leave no one behind. And this is important, as you recall, uh, our government policy is bottom up, and therefore we wanna make sure that the county is not just for individuals uh, uh, who probably have made it by all those people we need to open up opportunities for. That's why we talk about hope and opportunities for all. Inclusivity becomes more than a mere buzzword. It becomes a reality achieved through evidence-based decision-making. Safety and resilience, cornerstones of any thriving community are bolstered by our ability to predict and mitigate risk. In every area where, we see, where serious public risks arise, everything from public health crisis to natural disasters. We need all the reliable information we can find to meet these challenges. 
tapping into these new sources, we enhance our capacity to respond swiftly and effectively, protecting our residents and preserving the integrity of our city's infrastructure. Sustainability, a goal inseparable from our city's future, requires a delicate balance between progress and preservation. Alternative data sources empower us to monitor the environmental impact of urban development, ensuring that our growth is harmonious with our commitment to protecting our planet. And as you know, we have many programs that uh, we're looking at in the city, including a very, very deliberate uh, urban renewal program uh, that you want to uh, implement, uh, urban mobility that we are looking at, the use of uh, the, um, e mobility as well to take out uh, uh, fossil fuel. Uh, uh, transport and many things that we have we have told our residents you're going to do and we intend to keep each one of those promises and therefore uh, it is important that we have the right data to be able to make the right decisions uh, are the right people with it and to understand the impact to each of the uh, groups of people that uh, that uh, we deal with uh, think for example of the importance of the new air monitoring systems we are putting together or the new disease surveillance measures that this administration has begun to enforce. In embracing these sources, and for these ends, we show the commitment to responsible stewardship that echoes through generations. As we discuss the role of alternative data sources in governance, we recognize that they pave the way for a transparent, accountable, and participatory administration. Our decisions benefit from the real-time insights derived from these sources, enabling us to adapt swiftly to changing market dynamics. It's not just us. Information sharing and alternative data sources democratize access to knowledge, fostering innovation and collaboration. Our city's rich cultural heritage is a tapestry of stories, traditions, and aspirations. Alternative data sources enrich our understanding of this heritage, allowing us to preserve and celebrate, to celebrate it while also welcoming new and the diverse. In our view, the use of alternative data sources is not just a technological advancement, it is a mindset shift that empowers us to realize the aspirations of order, dignity, hope, and opportunities for every resident of Nairobi City County. Let us embrace this transformational journey, harnessing the insights that data offers to create a brighter, more inclusive, sustainable future. And I think in terms of the innovation that you've seen coming from uh, Nairobi City County, the number of uh, innovators, the number of uh, young people willing to get into territories that either two have not been uh, explored, it's, it's amazing. And all we need to do is to be able to give them an enabling environment that allows them to be able to move this forward. And so on behalf of the people of Nairobi, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this important kickoff meeting and look forward to a very fruitful engagement. Asante Nisan. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, from what you said, data matters, and it points towards achieving the goals. When you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their respective targets, you realize that for Nairobi City County Government, to achieve some of its key priorities in the next three and a half or four years, whether it's a question of access to water and sanitation, clean water and sanitation, health services, or to know uh, the need and uh, the kind of infrastructure that has got to be prioritized and implemented. I think this kind of partnership is very crucial. And I think to create a mental picture of all this, put it into perspective with clarity. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable director for partnerships and stakeholder engagement, Kefa Manga, to make his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, the Deputy Governor, the uh, Resident Representative of the UNDP, 
our distinguished partners uh, and all protocol observed. Uh, my presentation is uh, actually meant to give uh, a case of uh, how best we can be able to harness alternative data for better development diagnostics. Uh, this is a case where <clears throat> we use data as evidence for decision making so that we can be able to make the best investment decisions to solve the problems facing Nairobi. And therefore, I'm just going to look at uh, where we are as Nairobi as, as at now, the key development challenges that we are grappling with and uh, how best then we can be able to use alternative data sources. As government, we are used to traditional uh, source of information, official statistics, which sometimes is very limiting in terms of uh, how best we can apply in a dynamic environment in a rapidly urbanizing city like Nairobi that each day presents new facets of challenges that we must be able to combat. Uh, from the outset, I want to say that uh, Nairobi is very committed to Agenda 2030 and also our own Vision 2030 as a country. And the outlook is to ensure that the quality of, of life of uh, uh, Nairobians and Kenyans change and get to a point where uh, people are above or beyond the proverbial poverty line. And therefore, I want to look at what Nairobi looks like. The profile of Nairobi is big, perhaps uh, in the region, uh, is the capital city of Kenya, politically, commercially, financially, industrially. This is the uh, industrial base, and it contributes about 22% to Kenya's gross domestic product. That is non-trivial. Uh, uh, and then globally, it is the UN headquarters for the UN habitat, and it hosts a lot of international organizations that continue to make uh, significant contributions to the development of this part of the globe. Additionally, uh, Nairobi is the gateway to East and Central Africa. And therefore, if Nairobi works, most certainly the rest of Africa works. Um, the mantra of the vision of Nairobi is the restoration of Nairobi to a city of order, a city of dignity, hope, and opportunity. And these values have been voted for. And the decision here is to ensure that whatever we do, the investment choices we make touch the lives of people, and in particular restore order. We want to see people being able to utilize a safe, reliable, orderly, and predictable public transport system, a working healthcare system, and uh, a housing regime that is affordable to all across. And therefore, this is where we are for the next uh, perhaps 10 years, we are focusing on restoration of the city, uh, order, dignity, hope, and uh, opportunity. Uh, Nairobi has got opportunities that are very salient that we can actually ride on to ensure that the transformation journey works. And one of these is the population dividend. The city holds slightly over 12% of Kenya's population. And uh, the stable population is about 5.2 million people with 65% of this population being in the economically active uh, population bracket. And that is very significant. Then uh, political stability, we have a working government elected, a county executive and a county legislature that is oversighting the executive. Then there is diversity in the sense that we have a mix of players, both in the economy and socially. Uh, Nairobi's strategic location, there's no bidding we did to ensure that Nairobi is located where it is. But that is a fact that we can uh, not run away from, and we must leverage on that uh, to make the best out of Nairobi. Infrastructure. Our infrastructure, there has been a deficit of investment in infrastructure for many years. However, we still pride ourselves of superior infrastructural uh, position as, we, as, 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 as it is at the moment. And then the environment of Nairobi in terms of business is more friendly and uh, the government is making it more friendly through policies and uh, deliberate uh, initiatives, including reducing human interface in dealing with the government so that the government is limited, the private sector is expanding. Uh, the key challenges that we face as a city, and this is now the cranks of the data that we want to make use of so that we can create a menu of solutions 
in terms of policies, plans, and in initiatives. First of all, is the population budge, where we are seeing a bulging population, which is largely youthful, which uh, predicates the city to potential for increased destitution, uh, an upside of crime, and social unrest. Then there's water and sanitation challenges. Nairobi requires on a daily basis about 850 cubic meters of water. But what we are able to produce is about 525 cubic uh, million uh, cubic liters, which leaves us with a deficit of about 325 uh, cubic uh, liters of water or meters each day. And that means, uh, Your Excellency, the tabulation we have done lately is that if we do nothing about investment in new water sources, by 2033, we'll be having a water deficit of about 1.02 million liters per day. And that would mean, therefore, the city will halt to, a, uh, you know, because without water and sanitation, that's an issue. In terms of solid waste management, we are generating value in form of waste of about 3,200 tons a day, out of which we are able to, you know, transfer about 80% uh, to our dump site, but we need to invest so that we can, you know, draw value out of that. In terms of housing, and this is an issue of human settlement and an issue of human dignity, we are having a, a deficit of housing in terms of about 150,000 housing units annually. And this is an area that the government has put a lot of effort to ensure that we, you know, uh, distort the market situation in terms of supply of housing units, and in particular, affordable housing. The question of mass transport, Nairobi, you know, we, re we, we can say confidently that the only, and this is what the governor always says, the only thing that is public about transport in Nairobi is the, the passenger. Yeah, largely we are driven by private means and that is not efficient. Annually, we burn out about one million US, uh, one billion USD in terms of uh, transport because of its inefficiency. And so that is an area that we need to leverage on data, be it official data, alternative data, uh, so that we can be able to come up with policies that can be able to get it out of, out of that. Uh, now we proceed to look at uh, the use cases in terms of then what can we be able to do to be able to address the, how, let's let's switch I, I, the use cases. I want I'm not on the right slide as, as I can see. Yes. Move to the other. Jeremy, you are looking at me and you are not moving. Yeah, because uh, the, our partnership with the UNDP is anchored on uh, creating new capacities, creating new energies, synergies, so that we can be able to leverage on our in, uh, potential so that we can be able to get to where we want to be. So the alternative data sources that we are looking at include uh, digital and online platforms uh, so that we look at what has got social data, uh, social media data, what can we do with it in terms of our policies? Uh, what do websites offer? And some of the partners in this house are, are hosts to data that is so uh, significantly can be very useful for public service delivery and development diagnostics so that we can be able to understand financial behavior, consumer behavior, and that can be able to craft uh, our policies and uh, uh, create a new environment for business and the economy to thrive. Two, is about the physical world interactions so that we have to integrate the technology, technological advancement in terms of uh, embedded instruments that can be able to collect data uh, in terms of geolocational data so that uh, mobile devices, uh, GPS systems, and what we call the internet of things are opportunities that we have for us to be able to get data that we can be able to use. And uh, I want to say, Your Excellency, the uh, uh, project that we are pursuing of uh, transforming our street lights into smart street lighting system 
that it offers a new opportunity for us to be able to mine a lot of data that can help us to be able to uh, do our development much better. Then there is the question of big data in the sense of structured data and analytics. And this is an area that uh, traditionally the government has not gone into. And uh, this is one of the areas under this partnership we are pursuing to ensure that we make the best out of this. Then there is, of course, publicly available data and the uh, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. We must acknowledge the good work they are doing in terms of giving us uh, regular updates in terms of how the economy is performing and other aspects. Uh, now, the partnerships here we are looking at, how then can we use this data, for example, to shape our policies and improve service delivery in the area of health? Uh, you, you, you are running too fast for us. You are causing confusion in the data, in the world of data science. Can we go back to health? Yes, health here, yeah, this is where, and uh, the governor of Nairobi and uh, the deputy governor constituted a task force to look at how then can we move the healthcare system that was almost collapsing to a new area. And courtesy of a myriad of sources of data, we have been able to make milestones in various health facilities, but we have a long way to go and we want to leverage on data uh, so that we can drive healthcare planning and in particular, venture into telemedicine services. I can see Dr. Tari there nodding his head, meaning he's, uh, he's affirming that statement. Then we have the question of housing. We are looking at how can we leverage on alternative data for us to be able to work out on affordable housing in terms of mapping and also property informatics by looking at the property trends, how the costs are going and what's happening in the real estate. Then transport smart traffic management is an area that we must be able to unlock so that you don't have to spend a lot of time and burn a lot of fuel on our roads. Then integrated mobility solutions, including uh, the e-mobility solutions. Uh, safety and crime, looking at it from the perspective of the four pillars, is actually as the deputy governor highlighted of resilience, uh, safety, uh, sustainability, uh, this is an area that we want to see how can we leverage on data, be it social media data or uh, mobile device data and all the data that is held by other players to be able to detect crime pattern through analysis so that then we can be able to craft emergency response that is responsive. Uh, the next area of application of uh, alternative data would be on poverty alleviation. It may surprise you that Nairobi, like the resident representative was talking about paradoxes. Nairobi is also very rich on one hand and very poor on the other hand. There is plenty on one hand and there is uh, you know, scarcity. So when you look at uh, the level of inequality, the Gini coefficient of Nairobi shows that Nairobi is almost divided half half so that there are those who have uh, you know, uh, acute deprivation and there are those who are uh, swimming in plenty. So poverty alleviation in terms of financial inclusion, how can we leverage on alternative data sources so that we can create a sense of security and at the risk millions of Nairobians so that they can access financial services. Informal settlement improvement, here nothing further from data can help us come up with policies. A case in point is the you know, program of uh, Mukuru Kwa Jenga where we have done declared that part of Nairobi a special planning area based on data that was generated from the community itself. And uh, currently we are now working on restoring water, sanitation, infrastructure, and also uh, you know, emergency routes within that particular area, including healthcare services. Then finally, the question of financial services, how then do we ensure that the market works for everybody? and that there is a fair return on investment for every player within the city of Nairobi. Uh, I just want to conclude if, if my resistant uh, operator of the system cooperates, please cooperate. Let's move. Uh, so uh, basically these are some of the areas that uh, we have uh, uh, picked in terms of the areas that we think 
Nairobi can benefit on the application of alternative data sources. So what we need to do is to build capacities because there are challenges of using alternative data. It is the least understood perhaps, and therefore we need to up upscale the capacities and build what we are calling the, the that digital uh, physical infrastructure. I'm happy that the government of Nairobi City County has now a sector known as Smart Nairobi. We also have the digital and the startups subsector that are working collaboratively to create, to use innovation as a platform for emancipation of thousands of Nairobians from poverty. Therefore, uh, we are concluding by saying that uh, alternative data sources uh, hold the promise for a better Nairobi, and we cannot do less than work together in this journey of transforming the Nairobi by, and uh, you know, embracing the spirit and building our capacities to be able to leverage on these big uh, uh, alternative data sources for development diagnostics and implementation of our key initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Gefa. All right, uh, thank you so much. We were just consulting a bit. And uh, Kefa, that's been very brilliant as always. And that's why I said the incomparable Kefa Manga, uh, Director of um, Stakeholder Engagement and Partnerships. And uh, I think from Kefa's presentation, we realized that it's very crucial for us to question assumptions and find alternative, better ways of planning and streamlining, uh, whether they are county government uh, plans or even various aspects of our societal development. And I think for us to just get to have a discourse on all these critical issues, the next very brief session is going to be moderated by my relative Diana Sang, who will come here shortly so that we get to have a critical discourse on various perspectives on issues of data, whether you're special, citizen generated. And I think, of course, we have got even uh, a legal framework in the country that provides for how data can be used, the necessity of ensuring that uh, data subjects and data collected is also used in a manner that protects uh, the individuals and even the data that's been uh, collected, et cetera. Among us, ladies and gentlemen, before we go to the next session, we have got uh, the CECs for Nairobi City County, and um, we appreciate their presence and various directors that are in our midst. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, we just get to shift to that session to be moderated by uh, Madam Diana Sang, we appreciate that um, His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Nairobi City County, has got a very critical schedule ahead of him today, a couple of meetings and high level engagements, and he may not be with us uh, perhaps to the end of the program. And so as we make that shift, it uh, may be possible at some point that His Excellency the Governor, the Deputy Governor may depart from our midst for other critical engagements. Diana Sam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much um, to the MC who have just learned that we are relatives. We will find the data to ascertain that later. Um, but it's a beautiful morning. I thank you all for um, making time to get here on time in Nairobi on a Monday morning. Um, I agree with the previous speakers that this is definitely evident of the interest and the engagement and the commitment that is there uh, between the stakeholders today. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, I'd just like to set up the scene for this roundtable discussion and just emphasize on how the conversation around data is very key, not just in Africa, but in Nairobi, um, in Kenya, and then in particularly also in Nairobi. Kenya has set the stage for a lot of African countries in the data in the digital uh, revolution. 
um, Kenya designed the digital economy blueprint that is being used as a benchmark by um, other African countries, and they are aligning their digital strategies and processes based on the lessons and the guidance that Kenya has provided. That's on a large scale around the digital economy. When it comes to data and the opportunity for Nairobi, um, it's really encouraging to see the hope for the, the vision of Nairobi County on restoration of the city. And data has a key um, role to play there. Thinking about Kenya also, and I really appreciate the analogy that the MC shared around the vision of how we are harnessing wind. How can we think about how we can also harness data and really put Nairobi and Kenya um, at the forefront? Kenya, we have the largest wind power project in Africa, which is largely acclaimed across the world. How can we think of that now? How can we put now data there as well so that we can also have the largest example of how data can be harnessed um, at, um, at a country level to support uh, decision making and um, digitization and then also um, um, inclusivity and development in the large scale. To do this, I have uh, with us a panel of very esteemed experts um, from around uh, private and uh, public sector. And I will just request uh, our panelists to join me on stage. Um, and then we are going to keep it very brief, around two minutes for each of our submissions. Um, as we realize we're running a bit late um, and uh, I'd like to request that we be succinct. And then also we will have some time at the end of the session for any questions. So please, if you have a question, just note it down and then we will have a few minutes after the panel discussion um, to address those questions. Our dear panelists, uh, please join me on stage. Great, we can begin. Just to make sure we all know each other, um, I'll just request the panelists to a very brief introduction of themselves, just name and your role at your respective organizations, please. We will start with um, Sarah at the very end. Thank you, Diana. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sarah Muyonga. I'm a public policy manager, uh, part of the Eastern of Africa team at Meta. Uh, Meta is a social media platform and the parent company that owns uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Messenger, and lately Threads. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here. Good morning, I'm Tim Kelly. I'm a lead digital development policy specialist with the World Bank based here in Nairobi. Good morning. My name is Jeff Paulanga, Director of the Economic Coordination and Stakeholder Engagement with Nairobi City Council. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Winnie Karanga. I'm the Philanthropy Lead for Sub Saharan Africa at Microsoft. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lilian Njoro, the Head of Experimentation at NDP Kenya. Yeah, my name is Benjamin Mackay. I lead the uh, technology for development in Safari Pro. Thank you very much. We'll dive right into some of the questions. And I'd like to start with Kefa, because um, I'd really like to pick up from your um, fantastic presentation earlier. As somebody who is deeply involved in the county's um, development efforts, we believe that you've faced firsthand um, a lot of the challenges and opportunities of leveraging non-traditional data. You touched on some of those already in the presentation, but could you shed some light on um, what specific um, obstacles have emerged in um, 
in your efforts to harness this data? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Nairobi in particular stands at the crossroads of a data-led future, and therefore we cannot afford to derogate from the opportunity of uh, you know, delving into alternative data sources. However, with that opportunity comes not what I'll call obstacle, but uh, rather challenge, because I believe we can be able to surmount that challenge. One of the issues that we face is the question of data privacy, because uh, some of the data sources we are looking at have the potential of exposing personal information of sensitive nature, and uh, courtesy of the laws of Kenya on data privacy, that may expose the county to litigation. That is one area. Two is about the question of data quality. How then do you ensure that the data, the alternative data sources have credible, reliable, uh, you know, verifiable data that you can be able to apply for development diagnostics? So there is more that needs to be done to ensure data quality and uh, accuracy. Three is the question of compatibility of the diverse data sources. So that then how do you integrate, for example, mobile phone data with web data, with social media data? So that capacity and the infrastructure required to be able to process that kind of data is quite complex, and in particular for the county government, and that is an area that we need to look at. Then fourth is the question of uh, ethical considerations uh, in terms of what can be exposed and what cannot be exposed. For instance, in doing our school feeding program, and I want to invite on behalf of His Excellency the Governor, uh, all of you to witness the serving of the first hot dish, nutritious dish to Nairobi children on the 28th of this month. We used a lot of diverse data to come to that so that we are able to deliver 10 kitchens in 10 weeks, 10 mega kitchens in 10 weeks. But the question is, how then do you relay certain information in terms of people's nutritional status uh, without breaching ethical uh, considerations. And then finally, it's the question of capacity, and this is something that we can build within ourselves. Most of the alternative data sources are not empirical, and they are not necessarily uh, numbers. It is values. Then how do we build the capacity of the county government and its institutions to do, to, to use, uh, non-parametric methods or even do things like content analysis so that we can come up with data, um, um, you know, that we can be able then to apply. So those are the four that I can uh, pick in terms of the challenges that we face as a county. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks for the correction that they're not obstacles, but actually challenges that um, can be um, uh, overcome. Um, I'd like to shift gears to Microsoft, um, just piggybacking on um, uh, Kefa's, uh, some of the challenges he mentioned around uh, data sharing skills and capacities or how to, how to understand how to um, facilitate um, that. And um, we need Microsoft, um, you're at the forefront of many innovations and um, you've also played a key role um, on uh, capacity building and skills development in the, in, 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 in the country. Um, with a focus particularly on skills and data sharing mechanisms, um, how can the private sector, uh, like Microsoft, how do you feel you can support the public sector in leveraging non-traditional data? Thank you, um, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think as we think about data and kind of general digital transformation, there are a couple of maybe three pillars that I would think about. So one is... Um, the kind of the use cases that I think you highlighted very well, um, who is developing those solutions? Um, and then who owns that data? And then who owns the data and the data sets that are needed? And I think the challenges have been in terms of, if you think about the, a lot of the startups that are in Kenya, the challenge has been in terms of how do they access the data from government, from other research institutions, from universities, and you know, is it free and is it accessible? And I think that becomes a, a huge challenge in terms of how do we ensure that that continues to be uh, something that we continuously to harness. And I think that's a policy conversation, right? Um, when it comes to, uh, and I think he alluded to it in terms of open data, um, I think there has been a lot of conversations. I think what we can um, 
compliment Kenya for is that it kind of raised its hand and said, we want to be at the forefront of open data, but it comes in terms of the challenges of how to do that. Um, and I think Microsoft has been quite interested in that conversation uh, in terms of how do we guide. Um, we have an open data um, uh, policy, but also in terms of uh, templates that we could use in terms of what we've learned from other countries to support open data. So I think it's very important in terms of how do we think about the policy, the governance around it, and how do we ensure to facilitate the right infrastructure to do so. I think the other piece when it comes to capacity um, is in terms of policy. And I think we've mentioned it in, in a couple of many ways, but I think the aspect of policy and research, we cannot move away from that. Um, I think right now, when, as we're thinking about the AI revolution, uh, everyone is wondering about what happens to data and how do we access that data. And I think what we've um, I think you rightly mentioned Kefa in terms of, you know, we've been very dependent on the, the official statistics, uh, but also the universities to play a huge role in being able to generate data about issues that we believe is important for Kenya to resolve, right? Um, I think we just mentioned about community uh, uh, kind of collected data. And so I think the, the importance of being able to continue to build the capacity of universities and ensuring that we're able to continue to uh, support them in being able to um, facilitate the collection of data, because I think that is the most important thing, but also expensive. So I think right now it, it sits with the startups to collect that data and it's expensive to do so um, because they are trying to resolve some of the issues that you know the government has maybe uh, not continued to resolve or they are seeing gaps in the market and so they're really trying to do so but right now um, that it sits with them and so it becomes also very hard for startups to become very viable from a from a, um, a commercial perspective um, I think the other bit I would highlight would be in terms of capacity building from a skills perspective. And I think that's what you wanted me to highlight. I think there's been um, capacity from not only, I think all demographics. Um, so I think right now, what I what I love, micro, um, not only Microsoft, but also um, uh, UNDP, you are working on that uh, in terms of uh, public sector capacity building. So how do we build the capacity of all government employees to ensure that they understand what is technology, digital literacy, all the way to the roles and responsibilities that they hold. So some of them are already uh, statisticians, but you know, they can move into data science um, and, and AI, but also some of them need to just be able to empower and ensure that you know, they can use the solutions that are being built. So how do you ensure that you're building capacity across government employees and ensuring that they have the right uh, uh, skill set to be able to continue driving this transformation. The other bit is as well in terms of uh, the policy makers. Um, we cannot make policy if we don't understand what we are, we're making, right? So making sure that they understand what are the implications of emerging technologies and then how do we ensure that they are uh, well empowered to be able to make the right uh, enabling an environment to do so. And then finally, in terms of universities and um, uh, the general public in terms of making sure that we can support them in, you know, not only driving the innovation that we want to see, uh, but also at the same time, they can consume the technologies that we want to have. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Winnie. Um, I'd like us to stay a bit on the issue around skills and capacity and uh, data sh sharing, you know, data sharing mechanisms. Um, and I'd like to go to, over to Sarah um, right now to understand a bit more um, given Meta's key work in connecting the world and offering insights into data collaboration. Um, um, what would you um, share today in terms of how Meta um, is supporting um, data sharing, uh, opportunities you see to facilitate uh, leveraging non-traditional non data um, in Kenya and particularly in Nairobi County? Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Diana. Um, first, I'll start saying that I'm very excited by Kefa's presentation because I see a lot of opportunities in terms of some of the work we're doing. We have use cases in, in Nairobi specifically that we've partnered with various institutions. Um, also to mention that we have a more global partnership with UNDP under the Data for Good uh, program. Um, and I think it's really about leveraging data to, for social change specifically. 
So in terms of the question that you asked around skills, I think one of the things that I would like to highlight that we do is really about building capacity around some of the data that we've collected, because we understand that sometimes large data sets are quite complex and, and it's important to build capacity around that. I think one of, our, um, one of the areas that we've managed to collect data over time is around uh, high population density maps, for instance. Um, I think it's important to note like Facebook has around 3 billion users per day. And through the data, we are able to collect, you know, get a sense of where people are, how people move, uh, people's preference on different things. Um, so one of the things, again, we talked about here, and as Kefa raised the question around uh, privacy, around uh, our data takes into consideration, it's, it's sort of uh, privacy uh, preserving models. So we're not going to disclose personal things about like personal identifiable information, but we're able to aggregate the data in a way that it could tell different stories. So around this work, we've had interesting partnerships like with Stanford University, with local NGOs here, we've worked with Amnesty International, Pamoja Trust, and we've been able to use some of our high population density maps to help during times of crisis, uh, during the COVID period. Um, there's a specific research that was done around uh, uh, well-being of people, pop and poverty indicators. So there's a whole lot of things that the data is able to do. So linking it back to the question of capacity, I think um, through some of these programs, we also offer curriculums. We try to build curriculums and sometimes self-taught sort of modules to walk people through how to interact with some of this data. But when we did a lot of the work before, uh, especially during the COVID period and on some of these high density maps, some of the things we did was to train ministries and governments across the world, including Kenya, worked with Kenya National Bureau of Statistics to make them understand how to work with these particular models. Um, I think the other question is around mechanisms of sharing. I, uh, one that uh, my colleague from Microsoft alluded to, we totally support open source kind of data models. And that's the same um, um, sort of the same principle that we're advocating when we think about innovation, because it's really about allowing people to access, allowing people to use the data to for different purposes. We've looked at some of the challenges that were raised around Nairobi, and I believe some of the data sets can be useful um, and in relation to Kefa's point about how do you then um, figure out the quality of the data through the same principles is partnership. So working with researchers, working with uh, government agencies, like who are, this is their core business, like the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, to then, I would say, check the data for the quality. We've had such partnerships and we're able to ascertain that this is it. So the question of um, open source, the question of partnerships around um, about mechanism of sharing, and also at Meta, we believe in not complicating the process, but by using already existing places that people go to. So we have interesting partnerships with the UN, as I said, with uh, through like data sets around humanitarian issues when these crises, is. we put the data or made it accessible in places people already go to. So there's a couple of interesting partnerships, like I'm sure Tim Kelly will talk about um, the World Bank, um, I think data exchange partnership program. And so we support those already existing processes. So just to emphasize partnership, open source, um, and skills development around some of those things. Um, I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I know I've given you a task trying to say all that in, in a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it really ties in, as you can see, one of the challenges that Kefa mentioned from Nairobi County with the school feeding program is, yes, they, there's a lot they can do with data, but how can they do it in a, in a way that is safe and safeguards the end user and the, you know, the, the children? Um, because what can be shared? Who owns that data? We need to ask that question, who owns that data? 
Sarah has mentioned, they have a lot they're doing on high population density data, on you know, uh, poverty, data around um, poverty. So solutions exist. It's, I think just within this panel itself, a lot can come out of it, but we really want to, to take that forward. It's really how to merge and to um, leverage the partnerships that we have. Um, just to tie um, that section around private sector, um, Benjamin, Safaricom has played a major role in Kenya's digital transformation um, journey. Um, I think Safaricom was one of the first organizations that really embedded sustainability and then development within their um, uh, corporate strategy and not, not just as CSR. Um, we'd like to hear a bit also from you on, on your side, um, based on the um, lessons and the experience that Safaricom has had working very closely with the government, what opportunities do you see? And could you give a few examples of how Safaricom has done that? Thank you, Diana. So um, it's quite interesting. Actually, early in the morning, together with my colleagues, we are trying to ask ourselves, when we talk of uh, non-traditional alternative data sources, what exactly is it all about? And um, we're trying to look at it from the context of our organization, Safaricom. We exist to transform lives and the uh, lives of our Kenyans and their uh, subscribers in general. And um, being a mission-led organization, we, we really believe in scaling tech solutions as we purpose to become a technology company by the year 2025. Yes, we do have a lot of data. And uh, when we're trying to identify that, we have uh, data as far as core records are concerned, location details. We also have information pertaining the transactions most of our customers do. But actually, there is a caveat to this data. It's not our data. It's a data which we hold in trust for our subscribers and the government, the customers. So how we use that data is heavily and highly regulated. And we are still trying to scratch service to find ways in which we can use it without infringing on the, the privacy and the confidentiality of the people who have entrusted that uh, data upon us. But besides that, we believe uh, we can leverage this data to do good. And uh, we, we are a company which has a culture whereby we believe innovation is very crucial and collaboration is also very essential. It's through that uh, we are finding uh, ways in which we could work with like-minded organizations to find them uh, quite efficient ways of uh, leveraging on this particular in, um, data which we have without infringing um, what is already described as um, the ways we should uh, undo and conform and uh, make sure that uh, we use that particular data. What mostly we've been doing is that uh, if you look at the data which we have, is um, the, it's governed by the know your customer kind of like agreement we have with them when they are opting in for most of our service. And uh, we've mainly used it for our own internal consumption simply because we have an agreement with that particular customer. So some of the few areas we are looking at is uh, in the humanitarian space to see how can we leverage on it to ensure that uh, the vulnerable are um, able to access some of the services being provided by the partners we are working with. I'll cite an example, which is still work in progress, what you're trying to do with Give Directly, who are trying to conditionally offer some resources to people and monitor the way they are going uh, to get themselves out of poverty by provision of conditional grants. So what um, I would say is that, uh, and uh, my colleagues who are also here, we are trying to explore the best options and the best ways in which we can maximize on the potential of the data which we have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Benjamin. I think we've heard a lot about what are the challenges, what are the, the opportunities within private sector. And I think at this stage, I'd like us to shift a little bit to our last uh, section um, of this panel discussion, which is around thinking about the frameworks that, you know, the value that private sector data has to offer and possible strategies that um, could be applied. Um, I'll, looking at uh, Tim, uh, Tim, the World Bank plays a critical role in supporting development at global scale. Um, and with those experiences and your um, um, participation in that space, is there inherent value 
in private sector data for development diagnostics? Um, I think that will be the first question. And then I'll have another question for you as a follow on. Um, could you uh, just explore or share some of the structures or frameworks that are needed um, to provide private access to non-traditional um, public sector data? Sure. Um, both very good questions. Uh, thinking about your first question about private sector data, I think, as Benjamin says, it's not really private sector data. The data belongs to all of us. It belongs to me. It belongs to you. It belongs to us, whether it's data on mobility, whether it's data on how we use social media, whether it's data about how we create content. It's, it's our data. But as Benjamin says, it's the private sector companies like Meta, Microsoft, Safaricom that invests the money, the time and effort, the expertise to generate value from that data. Um, and, and, and therefore, what, what's important to come on to your second question about how we, how we use that data, how we can create a market for that data, uh, two key words, firstly, incentives, and then secondly, safeguards. So in terms of incentives, we need to be able to create um, a market which will incentivize the private sector to generate that data and to make it as widely available as possible. But on the other hand, we need to create the, the safeguards that will ensure that um, my data, your data is protected insofar as it contains sensitive or personal information so that my, um, my, my uh, history of uh, speeding fines, um, which if I had one, I don't drive, my, my history of speeding fines is, is adequate adequately protected. And I think it's worth taking a sort of historical perspective on how this is changing. Had we held this event 10 years ago, then the main blockage would have been the costs of collecting data. Over time, that's become much, much cheaper. If we'd held this um, conference five years ago, then the main blockage would have been how to uh, uh, extract value from that data. Again, that's become much cheaper thanks to AI. Holding this conference today in 2023, the main blockage is how to convert that data into useful use cases, how to create the incentives for private sector data to be channeled into worthy and, uh, and, and worthwhile causes. Thanks. I think as we have had here from you know the the big wigs of private sector, Safaricom, Microsoft, and Meta, there is willingness. You know they want to engage. They they would like to support further. But I think um, Tim, you bring about a good um, a key point there around incentives. Um, what is the incentive for them to support? Um, I think for Kefa, what 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 would be the incentive to bring in um, to tap into all these resources and skills uh, that is available and there is willingness to share? Um, I just want I know that I'm putting you on the spot a bit here, but if you could just think of a few just to keep the interest warm from the private sector team here because they have expressed willingness um, to share, and I believe this is going to be an ongoing conversation. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I'm not going to make a policy pronouncement <laughs> on this subject, but I must express the willingness of the uh, public sector to continue engaging. And uh, we know the private sector, apart from their you know, motivation to make a change in society and transform lives, they are also out uh, to make profit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think what team was a bit economical in terms of uh, these structures. Mm -hmm. I'll be consulting more with him soon after this so that we can start to work around the uh, practical um, structures that can create these incentives because out of every engagement, we must be able to contemplate some value creation. And then we deliberately create a sharing formula that creates also returns value because there's a lot of investment around data. Mm -hmm. And when we get this data at our end, there is a lot of value that we can also be able to make out of it. So it's a question of looking at where, as the county government, we can be able to ease on our end, to make it easier for our private sector partners mm -hmm. to continue doing what they do best, grow their margins, so that then they can have more resources to allocate to data, and in the end, then we benefit. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Lillian. 
last but not least, definitely not the least, um, UNDP's mission to drive sustainable development aligns very closely with the today's topic. Um, UNDP has played a really key role in bringing together all the relevant players and actors within this ecosystem, really enforcing the whole of society approach to anything that we are doing. Um, so to wrap up our session today, it would be good to hear about um, UNDP Kenya's uh, specific plans and strategies in supporting uh, public, public sector to leverage um, data for development. Welcome Lillian. Thank you, Diana. Um, I think a lot has been said by the panel. Um, and like you see, there are so many uh, good ideas in the room. So what we are doing as UNDP is seeing how can we leverage our convening power to bring together all of these different partners to the table. Like we said, it's all about partnership. It's all about working together, bringing together the private sector and the public sector to start um, unpacking this issue. Um, in terms of specifically what we're doing, we have a digital transformation portfolio that we are you know, developing and we've engaged various partners, including some people in the room here. Um, and I'd just like to point out three key aspects of that portfolio. So one is on the issue of data governance. Um, I think a lot has been said around issues of data privacy, how we make sure that um, the people who are generating ourselves, we are protected when you're looking at um, how we are accessing this data for development. So it's important that we develop um, architectures or structures that can help us when you look at data sharing in a responsible ethical manner, um, in a way that um, you know, factors in all the different ethical considerations and making sure that it's people-centered, that it's not extractive and so on. So you know, we are looking forward to working together with government counterparts. We have um, uh, MOUs we've signed with uh, Ministry of um, Information, Communication, and Digital Economy with the uh, Nairobi County government. Um, and we're looking to see how we can bring on board private sector partners to help us come up with the idea so that we can now move this conversation as um, Tim said now to the next level. Um, the second part is around collective intelligence. Again, it's looking at how we combine data and technology, but centering on people. So for example, we are doing this um, prototyping and experimentation in Tana River County, together with the county government, looking at how we are using citizen generated data and satellite imagery to look at issues of um, water scarcity and how we can you know, strengthen water governance, focusing on the communities who are the front line of you know, this crisis. So we're looking to see how we can generate um, practical use cases. I, I think uh, from Kefa's presentation, we've seen a lot of entry points. So we need to see when you talk about data for development, it's not an amorphous thing. We need to see practical entry points um, that we can start testing and prototyping and creating um, a practice or a knowledge hub that we can tap into. So, um, and that's where, you know, as UNDP, we have presence in 170 countries. We have a lot of um, uh, wealth of knowledge that we can bring in. So even when you look at work that's going on, um, for example, when uh, Kefa was talking about uh, issues of crime, um, our counterparts in Mexico are looking at how they can harness crime, uh, crime data and um, satellite imagery to map public spaces that are safe for women and identify what are the positive deviants that help make this possible and how can they invest in that uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of solutions even within ourselves as multiple countries. So how do we bring that also to the table? And then lastly is uh, what we need talked about, about the digital upskilling. Um, it's good to have all of this, but if we can't use it, then it's just another nice thing that we've launched and doesn't go anywhere. So it's important for the sustainability of this um, revolution to make sure that those capabilities are embedded and not just, you know, we have the ICT person or the data person, but across um, the public service, the same way now basic digital skills are so, you know, the norm. Yeah. How do we make sure that data is also part of that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. With that, we've wrapped up our panel session. I'd really like to extend a heartfelt thanks to the panelists for your great insights uh, for, and up apologies also for trying to make you share your wealth of knowledge within, within two minutes. Uh, but I think you like all agree with me that this was more of a Kickstarter. We've barely scratched the surface. We've had great conversations, but we've barely scratched the surface. So this really calls for, there needs to be more engagement, um, uh, closer participation, 
and shared learnings also, because as you can hear, there's a lot happening within our individual spaces, but we need to share this as well. And how could we come up with those mechanisms? And I really like to thank uh, UNDP's efforts to set up this platform um, for data sh for sharing of experiences and, and, and knowledge and networking as well. To wrap up the session, I think I'd like us to together, um, there's a very popular African proverb that if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, if you want to go fast, if you want to go far, you go together. Thank you very much, um, everybody. And thank you to the audience also for being um, very attentive and uh, a great audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Diana, and uh, the entire panel. Please, a round of applause for the for the entire panel. You see, data has been used for commercial interests much more than anything else. And now that we are trying to see mechanisms, approaches of harnessing and using data for development uh, and other things is very important. Because while we have had this discussion, and I appreciate Diana saying that we've just, in fact, we have not even uh, scratched the surface, the issue of uh, data use gymnastics uh, remains a concern, especially when it comes to risks and uh, the place of uh, you know, uh, the data subject choice use and rights that are to be retained is something that, uh, and from the remarks of uh, Safaricom, is something that I'm sure a conversation that we need to go deeper into and is very critical. I appreciate that um, our time has come to note because there's a, another critical meeting and some other key guests have arrived for the next session of meetings. And uh, that's why you may forgive me, of course, possibly without choice, that we may need to wrap it up. Uh, please forgive me. Now, for purposes of closing it up, allow me to invite on stage to make her closing remarks. But just before she makes the closing remarks, allow me to recognize the presence of uh, the GAZ uh, country representative, our country director, um, um, Mr. Bodo Eming, who is now here with us. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we appreciate your presence and support. So, Madam Madelina, Deputy uh, Resident uh, Representative of UNDP, to make uh, the closing remarks and also, I think, move the vote of thanks. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. What an exciting morning. I think these are the kind of forums or session that would have um, been dealt with further if we have just a bit of time to engage, to interact and to hear from you. But as the moderator said, this is the beginning of the discussion is to be continued. And there's, uh, there's definitely will be further iterations of us interacting and just hearing more on how we can move together. A lot has been said this morning, really, there's nothing new that I can say, rather to just summarize and to then assert and to congratulate the leadership of the Nairobi uh, City County in really just uh, taking the head start in using data for development to accelerate the delivery of public service in the, in the county in the sectors that has been listed, that there is indeed a lot of opportunities to ensure that services are efficiently uh, delivered, whether in education, whether in health, whether in sanitation, or just strengthening the infrastructure, if we can tap into the wealth of data that is there. We have also heard from the experts in the room, the private sectors who are helping to generate that data and the potential that is there to really tap into this data for improve the public good. But we have also then had the challenges that are there that we all need to surpass to be able to efficiently use this data in a way that is 
that doesn't uh, infringe on people's privacy in a way that build trust between the public and the, and, the, and the government and the private sector who are using this data. But the good thing is that there is the strong will between the government, the partnership, whether it's private sector or UNDP, but also within with the society that we need to bring on board to ensure that there is trust and with the trust that we're able then to use this data and to uh, for the for the good of the of the public. Really, I think the way forward for us as UNDP, as Lillian has uh, ably summarized, is that we continue in this uh, conversation, is that we all tap in together into the capacity to be able to help the government to move forward, and that we are ready to work with the private sector and to work with all our partners in the, both the developing world, including the GIZ and all the others, to help the county to move forward. So with these uh, few remarks, I think what I can say is that to thank the uh, Nairobi City County for the leadership and for the opportunity and for the interest in really wanting to move the development forward in this last decade of action, to thank our development partners who are all in this room, to thank the industry lead, the private sector partners who are here, whether it's Safaricom, Microsoft, and uh, Meta, and all the partners who are there, and to thank all of you for really availing uh, these uh, two, three hours of your time early in the morning to be here to engage and to partake into this discussion and to say that as UNDP, we will be uh, committed, we are committed actually to journey with you and to see how we can, you know, how far that we can reach in helping the government and the county to accelerate the service uh, through the use of big data. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Perhaps I may invite Kefa Manga to adjourn the session. Kefa, please <laughs> come and adjourn the session. Uh, let me do it from the low stage. Uh, with the permission of Waziri here, allow me to thank you very profusely for finding time uh, to be with us, our partners, the universities that are present, uh, the country, the re uh, resident representative for your information. We've just uh, kick-started another process of partnership with the universities, the 12 universities that we have in uh, Nairobi. And today we had uh, invited the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta University to join us. And we have seen a team of legal minds, and when they hear data, they are thinking about uh, intellectual property rights and the like. These are all concerns that uh, we must think about when we are dealing with this subject. But we must thank all of you, and particularly the UNDP, for offering leadership and convening us. And I'm sure in our next discourse, we'll be able to further discuss and find a way forward in terms of what we must do so that we start feeling the benefits of this engagement. Thank you very much, and may you have a, a, a good day ahead. Thank you. So the MC has just sacked himself, uh, but I think it's good uh, for us perhaps to have a word of prayer so that then we can adjourn. And uh, I don't know who in the room will pray for us. Yes, thank you, Dr. Chari. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sam Said, uh, representing the medical service sector. Uh, thank you for attending this. Uh, we have giants within our presence. So uh, I'll read from the holy book of the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahi rahmani rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman rahim مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Thank you very much